the brother man can do it better than you can, let him. Don't sweat him, dude. If the brother man can do it better than you can, let him. Don't sweat him, dude. If the brother man can do it better than you can, let him. Don't sweat him, dude. If the brother man can do it better than you can, don't sweat him, dude. Man, you hip hop motherfuckers are just so uncouth. Then if it means we lose some fans, cause we dare to speak truth, I won't care. I don't fear a punk producer trying to sound like Premier with a snare and a kick that he did from last year off a moment of truth. Man, respect your hip hop elders, learn your places of you. I reduce bodies to puppets with no self to give. And if there is no self expression, then hip hop can't live. So understand, cannibals cram, bot styles and swallow. Baggy clothes, sheep follow, never taught to lead. Just to tune my robots, no thoughts indeed. It leaves them hollow like a a child not taught to read so what's left left unless it's left on the shelf and these young beat boys are taught to think for themselves from a swole role model that's one an old mentor i'd have these kids breaking and painting the youth center see i learned early on it's not right to bite and to diss a motherfucker if the shit ain't tight you're not following rules right set by top wrong while the people Putting it down, starting a renaissance While you regress, rap a repress Cash cow, I try to formulate breaks To make cool hurt crowd Fuck a trend in the name In the game, I can't be it Y'all are killing hip-hop and just too stupid to see it And if I gotta be like that to get my foot in the door Y'all can keep hip-hop, man, I don't want it no more Yo, what's up everybody? Welcome to The House List. My name is Peter Agast and I'm the host. Uh, thank you for tuning in to my show. Uh, this is my podcast. My name is Peter Agast. Uh, you might know me uh, from one place or another, but for an hour and a half, once a week, or sometimes twice a week, I do this uh, podcast. I host it. Um, I record conversations with people. Sometimes they're like interviews. Sometimes they're just casual conversations, you know. And um, this is no exception. I think uh, there'll be a big cross-section of people that are very excited that I'm posting the part two of this. If you tuned in to episode 50 of The House List, it was my part one with Thess One of People Under the Stairs, the L.A. duo. A Los Angeles native himself, Chris Portugal, is our guest today on The House List. And... Uh, real quickly, the song that I opened up with is from their sophomore album, Question the Form of the Answer, which came out in the year 2000. That was an unreleased song from that. So splash that out there a little bit for y'all. Just a little taste, to, the, especially for the hardcore fans. And I noticed when I posted that uh, 50th episode that a lot of new people listened and subscribed. And I just want to say thank you for that. I really appreciate it. I notice it. I notice it at least on SoundCloud. But if this is your first time listening, or if you're just a casual listener and you have yet to subscribe, I, I absolutely encourage you to. I think it's a good look. I think it's good karma. Um, I think you'll come to appreciate the fact that you did it. Um, it's supporting an independently produced podcast, which is done entirely by me and edited by CJ Stewart. We do it all through email. <laughs> And uh, we pull it off every week and sometimes twice a week. And you can subscribe it on iTunes, on Stitcher. Um, It's also on YouTube and Google Play. And for those that peep it out on SoundCloud, uh, you can find it at the Houseless Podcast uh, on SoundCloud.com. And um, I see a lot of people tuned in. uh, And it's cool to people a little bit of the stats you know what i'm saying and while you're at it i mean if this is your first time or if you're first or second time listening go back and check out some of the other episodes now i know i do uh lately too at least in august i've been doing a lot of hip-hop stuff but i think that's a byproduct of my trip to los angeles where i met up mostly with people in hip-hop but i talked to a range of folks and that you know as you will see and if you've listened to the podcast sometimes i talk to people in the industry sometimes it's uh just a range of genres a lot of it is just scheduling honestly so just a little something little backstory there uh needless to say i hope you guys enjoy it i enjoy doing this for you but you know 
I'm do the, I spend a lot of time making these, so the very least, just subscribe and repost it, uh, retweet it at Houseless Pod is where you can find me on Twitter. And that's about it. Listen, uh, I appreciate it nonetheless, and just want to get the word out. So I have to pay some dues when I do that. Also, I wanted to say that if you have yet to pre-order the album I'm releasing on my long dormant label, Female Fun Records, some of you may know me from that angle. In the late 90s and early 2000s, I ran a record label. I released full-length albums from MF Doom, Sadat X from Brand Nubian, uh, DJ Spinna, Geology, J. Rawls, Raw Produce, uh, uh, Chris Lowe, a host of others. But um, one album in particular by the legendary producer DJ Prince Paul was called Instrumental. It came out in 2005, and I'm re-releasing it for the very first time ever. And it's coming out in September. You can pre-order it now. I'm doing a limited edition double vinyl. It's only 500 copies are made. And the pre-orders have been doing pretty well. But I want to make sure that we cover all our bases. So if you weren't even hip to this at all, check it out. It's Trumental is the name of the album. It's like a conceptual instrumental album, but with a whole bunch of stuff going on. It's not just like a regular instrumental album. It's Prince Paul. So there's a lot of things going on if you've never heard it before. Uh, with some great guests and some surprise guests. You can pre-order at redlinemusicdistribution.bigcartel.com And I'm saying, made 500 copies. I'm not going to repress it after we sell through these. And if you get the vinyl with the pre-order, you'll receive a download for a completely different, exclusively produced Prince Paul project called Redux, which you're not going to want to miss. So... And I, listen, I just announced a tour that I booked all throughout September, playing in Brooklyn, Miami, Charlotte, North Carolina, San Diego, uh, San Francisco, Chicago, and Atlanta. I just, I'm not even reading that off a piece of paper, if you can believe that. I just said that off the dome. So needless to say, I need to get the word out on it. So I'm using the podcast. So please pre-order that. Prince Paul Instrumental on limited vinyl and cassette. Get it now at Redline Music Distribution. So on to our conversation with Thess One. So this was done the following day. Well, actually, it's done in two pieces, one in the evening and then the following day. So part one was all done at Thess's uh, brick and mortar shop uh, in Torrance. And then we recorded another portion in his recording studio. And then the following day in the morning, we were kind of running around and we found a spot. So you definitely get, I mean, you know, recording this on the fly. I mean, doing it with the same microphone I'm doing this intro in. So needless to say, we cover a lot of ground. It gets frank. It's like two old buddies just chopping it up. And that's what you get with this. It's not a formal interview. Uh, I don't drill him on very specific questions, but I do want to talk about the group a little bit we talk about people on the stairs and we talk about his long-standing record label imprint peace lock 70 and the origin story with that um i mean he's not just put out physical music and, and digital music uh but surfboards and books he's printed some books and uh a lot of great shit uh, i mean he's i really admire Thess. i mean he is pretty brilliant he knows the record pressing uh world manufacturing vinyl very um much so you know what i'm saying like he has uh been hands-on with all the manufacturing and distribution of of all the records that uh people on the stairs have done but particularly at peace lock 70 so I defer to him in, in many ways as far as the chemical makeup of pressing a record. And we talk about that um, uh, at length. And it's casual. Listen, I'm just saying, I'm just, I'm just giving you a little forewarning here. Um, it's like two old buddies uh, talking shit, shooting the shit, rather. Not talking shit. So, yeah. Um, but... I admire the guy. I think he's such an uh, underrated producer and rapper. And I just want to put it out there. I love people on the stairs, obviously. And it's definitely for the heads and for the fans. But I think anyone that is that works at an independent record label or at a pressing plant or distribution company, 
anyone that's ever had to deal with releasing a record or even just record collectors in general, I think you'll get some insight in someone that's been at the forefront of that and spending his own money um, to do that for years and years. It's not an easy thing. It's not glamorous. Um, and he doesn't, um, you know, hold his words when we talk about that. And I think that's great. So anyway, I'm going to share this with y'all. Thanks again. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, on SoundCloud, however you might listen to it and, you know, copy and paste this post it on Instagram and, uh, or Twitter or whatever, send it to your buddy. If you're at a barbecue this Labor Day weekend, just show him your phone be like, yo, you need to check this out. It's called the houseless with Peter Augustin. You know, the guy that's putting out that Prince Paul album on female fun records in September. Yes. The, or the guy that used to do Culturama or the guy that booked your tour, so on and so forth. Um, anyway, peep it out. Enjoy. And I will see you guys in the outro. I'm going to play another unreleased people in the stairs on the outro too. All right. Enjoy this, y'all. Peace. I just don't want. It might sound. A I little just want it distant. to be comfortable for you. You know, it's um, never comfortable for me. Uh, but you have to get a little closer to me. Yeah, that's or, fine. Or lean, or project one of two. That's fine. But yeah, but I'm I'm rolling. So, this is kind of a sort of total side note, right? But uh, okay. we're talking about Groove Merchant Records and yeah, in um, San Francisco, San Francisco. And I know On that Hate Street, right? I, yeah, and I know that you're heading up there potentially, and. Um, I feel like if you could talk to anyone, even more important than myself, would be to try and get an interview with Cool Chris because Cool Chris, not just for people on the stairs, I know a lot of other people, mm -hmm. you know, um, DJ Shadow and like other people that have had some sort of impact on, you know, pop music and culture or whatever. Yeah. Uh, he's been kind of the guy who's been behind the scenes. I would say like an, time. Uh, an unsung hero. Uh, I know for us, when we got our advance for... Um, question in the form of an answer right double okay. k and i each got a check for ten thousand dollars and uh we were in san francisco at the ohm offices we went to bank of america and it was like a friday at like noon and we we're like took the check in and we we're like cash the check deposit the check like do whatever you gotta do but we want we each want to take like three grand each right and go <laughs> immediately over to Groove Merchant Records because we knew that the fate of uh, that project hinged upon whatever Cool Chris was going to like give us. Yes. That there. So um, we got the money. We got the cash and we went over to Groove Merchant. I think we got there at like one or two in the afternoon. It was like a Friday. And, you know, Cool Chris was behind the counter. At that time, I knew him. Like I had been in there a couple of times, but we didn't really know each other super, super well. But, of course, everyone spoke really highly of him. Um, and he just started, you know, throwing records at us. Like, hey, check this out. Check this out. He's pulling stuff from behind the counter. Hey, I think you guys are being in this. Like, yeah. Whatever. And he gave me, um, I'll never forget, he pulled out this record. And he's like, hey, he's like, hey, have you ever seen this? And, and it was totally, he had the ability as a record dealer to never come across as, like, condescending. Yeah, which is very, it's, it's a fine art. Too. It's a, it's, um, most record dealers don't know how to do that. Yeah. Uh, and other record dealers like to, there's, so there's, in my experience, there's two types of record dealers. One type will give me a record and be like, this sounds like a people on the stairs beat, which right. immediately I'm less like, well, dude, like if you knew, like, why don't you just produce my next record then, right. champ? Yeah. Uh, and then there's the other type of record dealer who will, uh, pull a record out. And be like, um, what do you know about this? Like, kind of like try and test you. There's a third type of record right, dealer right. who will pull a record out and they'll give it to you and they'll kind of, and it won't be priced and they'll gauge your facial expression, your interest. And if you're into it, because they know that you're like a producer and you make records, then all of a sudden the price goes up tenfold. Okay. Whereas, yeah. like, if some random dude like walked in and picked it up, they would sell it for like 10 bucks. But if that's one from people instead comes in and is into it, oh, that's a hundred fifty dollar record because <laughs> you must be buying it, you know. But Chris was never any of those dudes, and in fact, uh, we were in there that day. He didn't really know me that well. I didn't really know him, and he pulled out this record, Rupert Cobbett. Okay. He's like, hey, he's like, hey, uh, uh, have you ever heard this record? It's pretty cool. You should check it out. And um, I looked at it. I flipped it over. I showed it to Mike, and on the back of the record. 
there was this a sketch of a fucking cat All right. playing like a keyboard. And the cat had these like fucking like googly circle and we were dying <laughs> laughing. We were okay. tripping. We we're like, dude, look <laughs> at this. We we're like, look at the fucking cat. We hadn't even heard the record. We we're like, look right. at the cat. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So I went yeah. and I took it to the listening station. I listened to it and I dropped the needle on it immediately. I was just like, holy shit, this, this record is, this is it. Like, this is my sound. Like, this is, this is the direction that I was looking for for question in the form of an answer. This is what I was looking Amazing. for. Amazing. Okay. And so we went back to the hotel room and I had like, we bought the record. It was like 20 bucks or whatever. Went back to the hotel room. It was an album. Album. We had a stack of records. And immediately I pulled out that Rupert Cobbett record. And we're sitting in the hotel room with our advance. And we're chilling. We're drinking. You know, we're having a good time. We got our, we signed our deal, you know. Yeah, I'm and we're celebrating. We're celebrating. And me and Mike, and, and, I, and at that time, celebration was me and Mike sharing a hotel room. And like, <laughs> a, and like a, yeah. two beds. And, you know, we're, 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 we had all our records. And we had a portable record player. And I, I kept playing him the loop on the Rupert Cobbett. I'm like, man. And he's like, yeah, it's the fucking cat. That fucking cat. <laughs> Hell yeah. So went home, uh, made a beat out of it, made a song out of it, submitted it, first single, The Cat. Amazing, yeah. Which was a that was an incredible record off that's that the album. Cat. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we called it. We called it the cat. Yes. Amazing, yeah. And wow, it just came just like that. And he's yeah, like, hey, so that was check it. He's like, gave me the record. He's like, check this out. Um so on um, So he's responsible for the cat. And he's not he, it wasn't just the cat. So that day he gave me the Gat Man Joni, Diana and Autumn Win, Youth which was Youth Explosion. Okay. The Cat, uh, which is that Rupert Cobbett, he gave me um that same day and I mean when I say gave me, he was handing me these records like, Hey, check this out, yeah. check this out. Um also uh, not Code Check, because that was a Peruvian record. But oh, uh the July third sample. Oh um, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of that it's uh Glass Prism. All of that stuff came from that day. Like, like we got the we got the advance. We went in there and half of the samples from Question Form and Answer we bought that day at Groove Motion. Wow. And there was no, you know, it, it wasn't done with any like you know pretension or like like weirdness. It was just kind of like this. And from that day forward, the dude is a god. We're like Hell this yeah. guy is like fuck. He, he's that's it. Like. You know, that's go, incredible. Go yeah, him. yeah. And just that, that like, uh, it was such a just an innocent thing enough to just get that money and then go spend it on records. And yeah. uh, and it just happened to be that those were records that that would be turned into some of the most, um, you know, kind of crucial. Those are the both 12, the singles. Yeah, the singles, right? Yeah. So we started off like those. Like the reason those are the singles in part is because they were the, literally the first things that got made when we got home. Right. Because we had this stack of records we bought at Groove Merchant, went home, made Youth Explosion, made the Cat, and then submitted them. And they were like, "Oh yeah, it's the first stuff to come in. Like, let's you know, put it out." Amazing, love it. Yeah. So if you talk to Cool Chris. Definitely um, ask him about that Rupert Cobbett record with the cat on it. Like, whatever. Like, he, yeah. you know, and, and I know that it wasn't just us. I know there were other groups that were in that similar position that, you know, they showed up at Groove Merch and they were. Oh, I know it got, too. They got, you know, records. Absolutely. Well, I would love to um, uh, talk a little bit about the creation of Peace Lock 70, which is your label mm -hmm. that you are still very active, that you, that is. Now it's over a decade you've been running this yeah, thing, right? Yeah, yeah. It started in officially was incorporated in two thousand four, right? And what? So was the first thing highlighter the album highlighter, or what? What well, was the first thing you did? The first thing that we did was we got a credit card. Ah, <laughs> and because, the second thing is you maxed it out. Yeah. No, well, kidding. what it, what you know what we had to do was the, we you know we didn't have a ma we never had a manager or right. a booking agent. Um, but when you're touring, you know, you got to rent a car, you have to buy plane tickets, you have to do all this sort of stuff. And we yeah. never wanted to be in a position where anyone was doing that for us. So I took on that job as well. And I realized very quickly that, you know, if, if we're going and performing at colleges, right, they're going to give us a check and they're going to give us like a, you know, W9 and like, uh, like all 10, like all yes. this sort of stuff. Yeah. 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 So it all of a sudden it's like you know 
just being a rapper getting cash money for shows like that doesn't work anymore you actually have to have a business and you have to have a business plan and structure yeah so and every once in a while you're gonna get a check and you're gonna have to deal with it and that's okay or you'll rent a car you know or you gotta finance something you know like you have to press you might have to press a record press a record or you gotta fly to Europe four months from now and it's like no one's buying that ticket for you like you gotta a lot of fans don't understand this a lot of rappers don't understand this a lot of people just don't understand that like at the at the you know, I forget what the quote is, but the world is filled with, uh, what is it? The world is filled with talented, uh, like unsuccessful, talented people or whatever right. it is. Like uh, talent can take you so far, but uh, success is more a function of, you know, um, determination. And um, there are producers and rappers who are like uh, way more talented than I am. But, you know what they have in talent they lack in work ethic or determination or just the ability to listen to people or right. you know um so you know around this time right after um uh, stepfather i got pretty serious about just sort of thinking about you know what do we have to do to sustain ourselves as a business too mm-hmm. because it's getting a little more serious we're getting older you know like yeah. i had just gotten married yeah um i had kids potentially coming and um that was about the time I was like, okay, you know, uh, actually, I've never talked about this, but Mike, Mike knows we were in, uh, we were in New Zealand, and this dude was backstage, and he, you know, we're drinking and shit. He started talking. He's like, yeah, he's like, you know, um, I can't go back to the United States. He was American, you know, but he's in New Zealand. He's like, I can't go back to the United States, you know. He's like, I used to be the um, I used to be the tour manager for Shady Entertainment. And I'm like, man, this guy's bullshitting me. (laughs) Yeah. So I was like, and I, one of the things I love most about touring, aside from being able to drink local beer and, and, you know, all that sort of stuff, is I love hearing a good tour story. Uh Like, I love being on the road. If it's a promoter and they're like, hey, man, I got a good story about Party Artie. I'm like, let's hear it. You know, like, I want to hear, I want to hear a good tour story. Right. Yeah. So here I am in New, e- New Zealand. This dude's backstage. He's drinking, and, and he's like, yeah, I used to be the... And I'm like, bullshit. Tell me a story. <laughs> so he starts telling me this like crazy story about when he was doing the Up and Smoke tour. Okay. And I'm... I mean, the story... I'm not going to tell his story, you know, secondhand or thirdhand, but the story is insane. It involves Johnny Cochran, Snoop Dogg, <laughs> the Freedom Bridge. We... I mean... The story uh-huh. is so uh-huh. unbelievable. It's insane. Uh-huh. Um, you know, tour buses getting stuck in between international waters because they couldn't be allowed entrance into one country or another. Uh-huh. Like, gnarly stuff. Yeah. Johnny Cochran shit. And, I, and, like, the deeper he gets in the story, the more I'm like, I'm like, I don't know, man. And he's like, he's looking at me, he's like, you don't believe me, huh? And I'm like, no. Honestly, I don't believe you. He's like, what if I showed you a Shady Entertainment black card? <laughs> uh huh. And I was like, like one of, like a Russell Simmons black card or like a real. Yeah, oh yeah, because Def Jam had he had. Yeah, he had like a black card. card, like yeah, like it's a it's a prepaid visa, like yeah. it's like bl- but it's black. Right. He's like, no, no, like an Amex black card, which is a you know for those who don't know, uh, it's mostly a mythical type thing. It's a right. it's a you have no limit on it the monthly or the yearly fee on it is, you know, 10 grand or 50. It's insane. So he pulls out, sure enough, he pulls out a legit Amex black shady entertainment card with his name. And he's like, yeah, he's like, this card's not valid anymore, but this was the card we used when we checked into hotels. Okay. Cause when we checked into hotels, we didn't rent a room or two rooms. We got a floor. Right. And if there was any damage, it went on the black card. If we need to get a, you know, a golf wing, or Gulfstream, whatever they're called, to fly to you know to the next city, put on the black card. Right, right. That's how you rack up. That's like the you know that's the um, uh, Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, yeah, you know that's how you rack up that you know five hundred thousand dollar a month credit card bill. So he showed me the card, and I was like, at the time, I was like, oh wow, you're really legit. And in the back of my, I'm thinking, how come people upstairs don't have a credit card? Like how come we? Oh, okay. yeah. How come we don't uh, check into a hotel, right. put it on the card? And so when I got home, I was like, "How do I, 
you know, it, how do I aspire to get the people on there's black card? Well, we have to have a business. We have to have a corporation. We have to have credit line. We have to have this, that. So that's how PSOC started. Obviously, it wasn't going to be people on stairs uh, credit card because that's just too conspicuous. Right, right. So, so what, where did the name come from? So that was the thing. So I was like, all right, I'm starting a corporation. It's going to be a touring corporation for people on stairs. We're gonna, it's going to handle merchandise. It's going to handle hotels, rental cars, yeah. plane tickets. Uh, Peace Lock came from I. God, this is another long ass story. So you can edit this out. Fast forward whatever you want to do. I'll try and make it brief. Okay. I got commissioned to do a theme song for an NBC reality show. Okay. And I had never worked in uh, TV. And the pace of TV is like really quick. So like anyone who works in TV scoring or like wherever they know, it's like someone will come in and they'll be like, hey, we need you to score like the theme song for something. And you have two days. Right. And it's like gnarly. Like you have to turn it around. And these guys, the editors and the producers and whatever, they stay up all night and they do drugs and they just work, work, work. So someone was like, hey, we're doing a, uh, we're doing a reality show for NBC. It's called Next Action Star. And we want you to do the theme song. It needs to sound like a Beastie Boys type thing. Uh, okay, I can do that. Yeah, sure. Um, if if they accept it and it gets used, you know, you're looking at like you know four or five hundred grand. I'm like, okay, great. I'll stay up three days in a row for four or five hundred fucking grand. Yeah, sure. So I stayed up, worked on it one night. I worked on it another night, and on the third night, I went in to edit it, and I was working with my man Alex Newman. Yeah, and Panda. they were the only dudes I knew who had like a video editing rig. Uh-huh. So I took the theme song in because I they had given me the cut. They had given me like a director's cut of the opening and they wanted me to like drop my music over the thing, over the uh, the cut. So I went in there. I had been up for like three nights straight and I was tripping balls. <laughs> I was fucking gone. Then we were sitting in there and... uh you know, Kenya and, and Alex and Jamon was there and like, you know, basically all of Giant Panda and they were, they were helping me. They're working on it, you know, and I'm sitting there, I'm just like fucking in the corner, like just tripping. And, uh, all of a sudden I saw the door open and I saw like a, uh, like a lawn gnome, like a garden troll <laughs> walk in. Okay. And I screamed, I was like, Oh shit, there he is. And, they all turned around because they had, it was like midnight, but they had slept, you know? Like, they turned around and they're like, fuck, what? What's wrong with you? And I was like, don't you fucking see him? Here he is. And they're like, what? What is it? And I was like, it's the fucking, it's the fucking peace lock. And they were like, what? What is that? Okay. And I was like, it's like a, um, he's like a warlock, but he doesn't come to bring war comes to bring peace <laughs> and they were like what <laughs> this was all told to me later and i was like yeah man it's fucking peace locks here and so they were like yeah peace locks in the house i was like yeah peace lock in the house <laughs> and so like all night i was tripping on like the peace lock and so then it just kind of like became a thing and then i added the 70 because uh again tripping that night uh like you know like Sergio Mendes in Brazil 70 oh yeah yeah like whatever and like there's all these bands it was like something something and the something 70 right. and I was like yeah man it's like it was Peace Lock 70 it's a fucking new shit that no one knows about <laughs> it's the new new and so that was it so then I incorporated Peace Lock 70 nice yeah so so then when does um a highlighter come into place cuz that's like obviously in you know the in the canon of people under the stairs albums. I right. mean, it's, you know, and peace Ox 70, it's like the first real album that you guys right. do on the label. It's, and it becomes your label. Right. But, um, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out like, you know, it, obviously there's a lot of stuff that comes into right. starting peace Ox Cause you all, you already kind of helped start a label before that trust yeah. records. Yeah. yeah. That was so, a disaster. Yeah, but we don't necessarily have to get all into that. But, I mean, like, at the same time, right. like... And Peace Lock wasn't, like, you know, just so I'm clear, like, Peace Lock wasn't meant to ever be, like, a label. 
Right. So PSOC was basically just a way for Mike and I to travel and tour and do shit. Not as Mike and Chris. Because you can't. Like, you can't rent a car as Mike and Chris. Yeah. Like, you have to be a fucking business. Right. You can't rack up, like, frequent flyer miles as Mike and Chris. Like, it's like, what business is booking this shit? It's fucking PSOC 70. Right. So, you know, then that, of course, uh, spilled over into being able to make merchandise, T-shirts. Like, well, t- who's making these T-shirts? Well, PSOC 70 is. Uh, all the merchandise for people in Sarah's was powered by PSOC 70. Right. You know, Mike. Or Chris needs a loan. PSOC 70 is loaning them fucking money from their bank account. Yeah. Like, whatever. Like, it became a thing. Uh, and then, of course, along with that became filing taxes, payroll, like all that other stuff that comes with running a business. But it was good because for the first time, you know, people on the stairs were starting to have, like, act- an actual, like, footprint. Like, a financial footprint. Right. So we could check into a hotel and get rooms. And it's like, no big deal. Rent a car. No big deal. Um, when we started working on another record after Carried Away, which was on Ohm, again, we didn't get into back into why we went back on Ohm and then back off of Ohm. Right, right, right. right. Which is like l- another long, convoluted story and just, you know, poor decision making. It went back, of course, to the same thing, which is why don't we do it for ourselves? So, Mike and I basically said, well, like, why don't we use PSOC, which is funding our touring? To fund a record. Yeah. Because we can. Like, we, we have credit line. We can fund. If we can buy plane tickets, we might as well buy pressing. So, there it is. Like, now all of a sudden, we're back in the studio working on a highlighter. And I, you know, me personally, like, I feel like highlighter is uh, a kind of a lost record. Because I don't feel like it really landed a strong punch with anyone in particular. Yeah. But I feel like there's good material on highlighter that gets overlooked yeah i mean it's it's definitely like i think comparatively to the other albums it's slept on for sure yeah but i remember when it was right about to come out because oh. it's when you did the first uh gov ball in new york city yep. which is now a gigantic festival sure. in new york city you did the very first one and it was like and it was when mac miller was doing his people on the stairs freestyle over yeah, yeah we uh, performed with neon indian and i yeah uh, i'm a huge i mean like i um Neon Indians, uh, what's it called? Uh, Chinese Night School or whatever the fuck it's called. Right. Yep. Uh, that record is like top five for me. Like I love that record. Yeah. And so to you know, being asked to do Gov Ball, which uh, again positioned us in a weird place where we're like again we're performing for like sixteen, seventeen, eighteen year olds. Right. And we're being lauded for stuff we did like fifteen, twenty years ago, and like we're performing for kids. In front of a hundred thousand people, yeah, I'm like right. tripping again. I'm like, damn, we're back at it. And that was the high. That was that was when like it that was, was highlighted. Yeah, yeah, when you introduced it. So did it? If if I'm not mistaken, like, did you put the record out inside of like a highlighter pen? Did that ever happen? That was an early concept, right? Definite concept. Um, I you know when we were did that bo- happen. No. Okay. But when we were in Brazil, I met this uh, really dope artist named Felipe Mota. And we, you know, we bonded. He was a fan and whatever. And so we came up with a really, you know, kind of intricate um, packaging for Highlighter, which which was really, when I say intricate, it's it, when you look at it, it doesn't look like much. It's like recycled paper and yeah. highlighter ink. Uh, but that's actually a really hard thing to do when you're manufacturing a record. So, you know, the, the, the LP was, again, an exercise in excess. It had an Oban die cut, uh, number stamp, Pantone call-out inks. It was, it was as expensive a, as a record has ever been made. It was <laughs> super fucking ridiculous. And it was the first People on a Stairs album that... That since, we were funding, yeah. Since like, the very first uh, Next Step. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, that we were back in... A, in and so I'm just watching... I'm watching the bill, like, skyrocket and go out of control. And then um, we had issues with the pressing of the actual vinyl. Mm-hmm. Because... So that period of time... So that was 2000 and... Uh, like 10? Yeah, yeah. Around that time. That was the dark ages of vinyl pressing. Yeah. And when, the reason I say that is because uh, that was around the time when most of the plants had, prior to that, shut down or diminished their vinyl output across the United States. 
And then all of a sudden, all these people want to make records again. Now, we had been making records. People in says we had been making records consistently. Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden, in 2009, 2010, now like Urban Outfitters wants to carry vinyl and they're repressing the Ghostbusters 2 soundtrack for no fucking reason other than it's record store day. Yeah. And all of these plants are getting slammed and they're not, there's not raw materials to deal with that. Right. And so, um, you know, around that time, I would, because I had the history, and this is going back to me and Pete Lyman and meeting all these people. Yeah. And I used to work with this pressing plant called uh, Bill Smith Custom Records here in El Segundo. And Kevin, who ran it, who was Bill Smith's son, he was he was a homie. Like I, you know, I'd walk in there, we talk. Man, man, how's your daughter? How's everything? It's good. They let me walk back there, and I would hand mix the PVC pellets for the colors. Like they'd be like, "Yeah, Thess is here." They'd let me go back there, and I would take a a handful of one color, handful of another color, and I would pour it into the hopper and we would make the records so for people that like might not be familiar with like the actual manufacturing of records too pvc is like it's basically the same stuff they make pvc piping with sure and stuff. It's, it's, it's polyvinyl chloride yeah it's, it's kind of like a form of plastic right? it's fucking plastic yeah. yeah and uh to to be more specific if you go back to the 60s the 70s the 80s when vinyl ruled the planet like right. when it was the primary medium of getting uh music out right? yeah sure um the there was a huge uh stream of raw materials coming into the united states specifically to make records okay so what would that stuff be so that pvc was coming in uh and it comes in in pellet form and the pellets so they're these little balls like bb's yeah. little pellets of pvc Let's say it's black vinyl, like little pellets of PVC black vinyl. They go into the hopper, which is like the feeder for the machine. Right. Squish together. And your stamper, which is basically an inversion of your lacquer. So it's a it's a it's basically a reverse mirror image of your you know, of your record. Of your record. Yeah. And it basically does a play doh fucking machine squish yeah. of of your PVC pellets. So it takes a little puck of PVC pellets at a certain temperature and it squashes them with the stamper it stamps your record into right. that and yeah. that's it so like you take a mirror image of your record now back in the day when those PVC pellets were coming in and they were used mostly for music vinyl they put lead in it a lot of lead okay and that so where was that coming from was it like in the US or was it yeah, being sure. exported yeah okay. fucking coming from wherever like yeah. as long as the demand was met right comes in and also the specification was put fucking lead in it like put all this lead in it because the lead lowers the noise floor and okay. it makes the vinyl fucking sound better right okay interesting all right so you know in the 70s in this in the 60s 70s and 80s you got this vinyl high lead content it sounds fucking great fantastic fast forward to you know 2008 2007 2009 right not a lot of the vinyl is being made. Yeah. And so most of the... PVC and the plants are closing. Plants are closing. Yeah. People are shutting down. People are struggling to get stuff done. You had those people who were like doing fluff pieces and like fucking like HuffPo or Rolling Stone. They're like, vinyl production is up 4,000%. Yeah, like it's up 4,000% from fucking minus... One million of what it was <laughs> in 1978, you know. <laughs> right. So it's up four thousand percent to to point two percent of fucking like the max that it ever was. Okay, all right. And, and if that makes sense, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. So I, didn't, I never thought of it in those terms, but that there makes were all a lot these like press fluff pieces, like sure. vinyls making a fucking comeback. Uh, I remember seeing all those. Yeah. yeah. And now you see it at Starbucks and sure. at Barnes even, and Noble. Even when you see it at Barnes and Noble, even if you see it in Walmart, it's still a fraction of a percentage of what it was in 1988. Of course, of course. When you walked into Tower Records and every single record was on, you know, vinyl. Yeah, yes. At that time, they were using lead in the PVC. Records sound amazing. So, fast forward to then, now, which was 2008, 2009, we got PVC coming in from Thailand. We got PVC coming in from China. None of it's being made here. And the EPA says, okay, all this PVC pellets that are coming in, some of them 
five percent, seven percent get used for vinyl records. All right. The rest of that shit gets used for medical purposes. Right. Catheters, IVs, uh, you know, all of that soft plastic that looks like a melted record right. that you see in a hospital. It's all the same shit. Yeah. So clear vinyl for a clear vinyl record or clear vinyl for a, a you know an IV bag catheter yeah. or fuck you know yeah. it's all the same material soft Amazing. flexible pliable yeah. PVC so the EPA said no more lead there's n- you cannot put lead in this cuz we can't be injecting people um you know if they're getting an IV like a yeah. was a splint I forget what it's called like the thing that goes in um well um a stent a stent has yeah. the same uh, rigidity yeah. of like 120 gram vinyl. That's amazing. That's crazy. A clear vinyl color. Same thing. It's the <laughs> same yeah, that's fun- so funny. The same pellets that right. make that, right? Yeah. So that, understandably, the EPA says, look, you guys can't put lead in, the, in, in this shit anymore because we don't know where it's going to go. It could be a stent. It could be a, a record. Yeah. It could be the Ghostbusters 2 repressing. We don't know. Yes. No lead. Take the lead out of it. The sound floor goes way up. The audio quality of the vinyl goes fucking way down. Uh, it, it's horrid. So a modern pressing black vinyl of, you know, Sgt. Pepper. Right. Versus a pressing from, you know, 30 years ago, black vinyl. That one from 30 years ago is going to sound eons better. Right. For no other reason than that the raw materials that they're using are better because they're more toxic from back then. The other issue is polyvinyl chloride has um, a very specific uh, heat tolerance. Okay. Once it, I, I don't know, I don't know the exact temperature, but once it goes above, like let's, I think it's like 118 degrees or 120. It's very low. Once it goes above 118 or 19 degrees, the chloride separates from the polyvinyl or whatever. And right. It basically okay. turns into a gas. Okay. So basically, you get chlorine gas. Wow. And I remember there was a trend where people were putting uh, records in ovens to make like popcorn bowls or like oh, yeah. fucking purses and shit. Like yeah, yeah, early definitely. Etsy, like Etsy 1.0. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I remember, I remember like knowing like my, in my rudimentary knowledge of this, I'm saying to my wife, like these people are going to fucking kill themselves. Like they're putting a vinyl record in an oven at their house at like 250 degrees. They're going to release the chlorine gas or like whatever. Like if they start moving wow. it yeah. down. Yeah. And they're basically releasing fucking like raw straight up like chlorine gas. Now. Huh. Yeah. The shit. I mean, it's chemicals. It's yeah, complicated. Yeah, yeah. I'm not. Uh, I don't claim to be a chemical scientist, but. No, but I mean, uh, in, but records are made out of like harsh chemicals. Fucking chemicals. Yeah. yeah. This is this. So you saying that that is that right there is a sticky wicket. That's the ultimate point is that records are fucking bullshit for the environment. Right. Records as a medium are the fucking worst thing that we could be distributing music on our art on. They yeah, are. But they're so great, though. Yes, but from an, yes, but from an environmental standpoint, whether course, you're talking course, about the manufacturing, like just to get to the point where you're melting down the PVC to make to make a fucking Play-Doh stamp. Right. I mean, we're talking 1940s technology. Yeah. This shit is has not changed since the 40s, 50s, and just to get to the point where you're melting down fucking polyvinyl chloride at a controlled temperature because God forbid you release fucking chlorine gas. Just to get to that point, you have to plate. Two things of aluminum with nickel in a fucking bath, like they, you know, really? to make the, yeah. The stamper is a reverse; <laughs> it's a reverse plating, and they don't allow new plating companies because the EPA is so fucking toxic that you have to be grandfathered in to have a fucking plating business. Oh wow! So there's Mastercraft in New Jersey. There's like yeah. two other ones, like RTI and Oxidarn. But other than that, you can't just say like, "Oh, I'm gonna start a fucking plating company." And if you can't start a plating company, you can't make records. You have to yeah. plate the records. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's how they get made. That's how they get you make your You make your inverse snapper, right? right? It's so fucking toxic. Shipping records. The carbon footprint of shipping a box of 30 fucking records from <laughs> here. 
is enormous. Yeah, yeah. It's, that is true. It's yeah. massive. So you go into fucking Whole Foods and they're selling a fucking like organic 180 right. gram virgin vinyl pressing of Cat Stevens. <laughs> right. But the carbon footprint, the ecological fr- footprint of that particular record is enormous. It's off the chain. And people say, well, well, what's better than that? Streaming the fucking record. Yeah. Yeah, but now... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and I'm not even talking about paper sleeves. Chopping down trees. Well, that's why you gotta do plastic sleeves, right? Is that any better? But no, it's more chemicals, man. Well, what, plastic is the, the fucking okay, devil. Between plastic and paper, what, what, what is your... Is there an option? The, the best option is to stream. If yeah. you are I'm concerned about, about the records, environment, though. no, but if you're concerned about the environment, if you're concerned about global warming, if you're concerned right. about the future of humanity, records are, in my opinion, they are the, uh, you know, they're the Land Rover they're, or the Range, what's the big fucking, they're the Hummer. Yeah. They are the Hummer of, mu- of music appreciation. Right. They're obnoxious, heavy, uh, they're laden with fucking like they have a long tail of carbon footprint and uh, natural resources. I mean, they're just they're 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 unnecessary excess to the utmost extent. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, and this with, is coming from a guy who fucking makes records for you people make because records. they demand them from people me. People love you for they your love records me for my weird and your records. and yeah. your ability to sample with records, your use of sure. records in all your albums right. too, but uh, the futility in it. Yeah, and it's, the, a, and it's the, a bizarre, um, you know, piece. Yeah, I mean, look at turntables. I mean, that's what they exist solely for these pieces of plastic. Sure, you know? and people are willing to buy new twelve hundreds at what two grand? What are the was the new twelve hundred? They're around that, uh, as far as I know. I mean, and getting an old one, I mean, you better believe. Even even when they weren't that desirable, they're still five hundred dollars at least. You know. So now. for so for any listener who's listening <clears throat> and they're listening to part one, now listening to part two or whatever. We had a couple glasses of wine. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So just let it be Thank known. You know, Thess has had a couple drinks now. now I'm really... slightly lubricated, but this is not the alcohol talking. From someone who makes records, from right. that standpoint, the biggest irony to me is that I am, as someone who loves, as someone who serves, as someone who cares deeply about the environment, I continue to make records, not because they make me feel better, not because they make my dick longer. But because if I didn't make records, my fans would fucking, they, you know, I get emails saying, oh, where's the day, re- where's the new record, like, you right. know, where's the record? Well, is there an environmentally conscientious way to make a record that you have found in your... Yeah, SoundCloud. Yeah, I'm talking about a I physical piece of record. No. Is there, is there, has there ever been an alternative to PBC or anything? No, that, the, yeah. the alternative is not to... The alternative is not to use materials you don't need to use. Right. And in 2017, we do not need to be making records. This is a fact. Yeah, but between would, Serato right. and streaming, records are a luxury. They're a first world problem. Sure. Well, and they yes. are they are wholly unnecessary. And if someone brings up the argument, well, how do we know about the liner notes? Sure, that's an issue. But like, there's PDFs. There's ways. That, I mean. There's yeah. Wikipedia. The information is widely available. Like, right. we don't... And again, I love records. I collect records. Right. And, but, yeah. I've got a... I buy new vinyl. Right. Still. But but this is a first world problem. It's a first world problem, but you can admit, as a avid, one time a very serious record collector, like, there are, are many third world countries that right. manufactured records. There's many that did that did maybe not they might not be doing that now no hell no but in the but in like the Cuba could barely Cuba you know during the embargoes and whatever <clears throat> could you know if you collect Cuban records you go back some of the records barely have covers because they didn't have cardboard to spare yeah they have weird plastic waxy covers yeah stuff, right, right exactly or like if you go to Europe in, in certain um, Eastern European uh, and countries in the Middle East as well Middle East is struggling with natural resources right but the reason they did it was because records were the only way to spread the medium of music at the time. Yeah. Now in 2017, if resources are tight in Syria, people don't people don't not make music because they can't make records. They make music and they distribute it through cell phones and like through the cloud or like however the however the hell they're going to do it. Right. But records in and of themselves are an archaic 
you know, um, they're a rich man's medium. And a- any dude who's had to move from an apartment to another apartment <laughs> and move their records, they'll tell you, man, these records are fucking bullshit. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I did it cross country. Yeah, yeah, it's an anchor. Like, you're tied to your records, and, yeah. and you start wondering, I wonder if there's a better way, you know, to deal with this. And that's pretty much way. how Serato came about, right? Um, yeah. But you know what you use? I mean, well, now people use CDs, but I mean, Serato also relies on control vinyl, which is made from yeah. PVC. But like, you can you can you can have two records in your collection. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's different, of course. Yeah, I know. I mean, listen, we can argue it both ways, and it's a good argument to have. It's a great theoretical conversation. Sure. And it's way. not even. I mean, again, I because you know, as we sit here and speak. I got a shipment of 750 records or 500 records coming in like in the next day or two from fucking Czech Republic. Uh-huh. Right. You know? Now, okay, here, this is and, a question. And, 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 okay. let me just say this, that I used to make my records of fucking in El Segundo at, uh, with Kevin at Bill Smith. Right. So now I don't have a choice. I have to press them in fucking Czech Republic, which means that now on my shoulders, I carry the brunt of the fucking sea travel of the container travel, yeah. which is far worse. Like offshoring pressing is far worse than right. yeah. than any of the immediate ecological impact of pressing a uh, actual record. Right. Like the bigger issue here <laughs> is the fact that they have to come in on a container. Yeah. Across the fucking ocean from the Czech Republic to the LA port. Right. That's a bigger. That's a bigger issue. Right, right. And, but you'd be amazed. I mean, you might not be, but I think the general public would be about how many pieces of vinyl are made uh, of American artists and yeah. record labels, as well as probably in Europe and in the UK, but how much of it is actually manufactured in the Czech Republic? Probably 85, 90% of it. Yeah. And and it's been for years. Oh, yeah. 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 And I mean, we're talking child labor, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. I don't I don't even know what the worker conditions are, uh-huh. right? Because right. it's like... Once it's offshore, it's like not even my it's not even my concern. I know when I was pressing it in El Segundo with Kevin, which El Segundo is like, you know, eight miles from here. I would yeah. drive over to the plant. I knew the workers. The guys had families. I'd give them tip like a hey, Christmas time, I'd bring them a ball of fucking, you know, Jack Daniels, like whatever. Yeah. Um it was hard for me to keep my heart in it in vinyl once it became this sort of offshoring Right, series of emails and cloud transfers, and you know, press over there. But I will ask you this: I mean, as far as um, are there are there American pressing plants that you have worked with recently? Like, I mean, like, why is it that there can't be uh, a you know a a range of uh, plants that can be used uh, domestically Mm -hmm. um, to cut down on one on the carbon in in, uh, imprint mm-hmm. uh, footprint uh, but because of the fact there's so many American labels that are pressing vinyl it's probably why can't we all do it here yeah and it's it doesn't a... have to be a specialized thing that Jack White is doing like why can't there be more right. broader ones is it a, is it a matter of the actual pressing the the machinery for pressing plants is no longer being manufactured or and, like is no it... I think I think really what it comes down to is that we are just like everyone. We are running businesses, and we're even though everyone feels emotional about vinyl, right? People get very emotional about vinyl. We're going to the record fair. <clears throat> God, it's a piece of vinyl. But for the people who work in the industry, it's a it's just a business. It's a product. It could be widgets. It could be horseshoes. It doesn't yeah. matter. Like it's fucking anything, right? And just like any other manufacturing uh, sector in America the cards are stacked against manufacturing in America. And this is not something because of Trump or Obama or Clinton or whatever. This is, you were talking decades of making it easier to offshore manufacturing to other countries. Because you could say the same thing about the iPhone. Apple is one of the rich, they are, I think, the richest company in the entire world. Why doesn't Apple make their iPhones in the US? Like, why don't they make that shit in Torrance? Yeah, why? Fuck, I don't know. I mean, they, I don't know. They like, a, my uh, iPhone still costs eight hundred dollars. You know, like whether <laughs> right. it's made in China or it's made in Torrance, like it doesn't it doesn't matter to me. All I know is I need the iPhone. So, I look at my consumers, and I never my customers. I never look at them and go, "Well, you should care," because I don't care. Like basketball shoes, 
guys didn't stop buying basketball shoes because they're not made in America. Like, not a single fucking basketball <laughs> shoe is made in America. Right. Yeah. Um, barely any shoes are really made in America. Right. You know? Exactly. Well, like, why? Yeah. So, you know, those sort of, like, open-ended questions apply to vinyl at this point now because vinyl is just a product like basketball shoes and iPhones. No question. Yeah, And people are like, true. fuck, why is all the vinyl made in Czech Republic? I don't know. Why are all the basketball shoes made in China? I don't know. Yeah. Will it ever change? Probably not. Yeah, right. <laughs> like, <laughs> because the cards are stacked against anyone who tries to start a plant here in competing with that foreign pricing. Or is it EPA regulations? Is it child labor? Whatever it is, there's no way that you can turn a profit by making it here in quantity. Like Just like any other product, even though we, uh, we uh, tend to romanticize vinyl, it's just a fucking, it's a, it's a widget. It's a nothing. And it's wholly unnecessary in 2017. Right, right. There is no reason to buy vinyl of a record. And I say this is a dude who makes vinyl. Yeah, no, I know. That's I my know, primary know, source of income. But we don't need it. Yeah, but, yeah, I mean, you're, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're also kind of, supply and demand is a thing, you know, and you're providing a service and there is a market for it. But I mean, at the same time, I mean, I, I, uh, understand that, um, you know, it's, uh, it is a luxury and it's a boutique kind of item yeah. like high price shoes or clothes and, you know, stuff like that. I mean, maybe a status symbol, you know, and I'm not talking about old vinyl because old vinyl you know, like if you do a set and you do an all vinyl hip hop right. set, you're spinning vinyl from 92. Yeah. That vinyl sounds fucking amazing. Yeah, it sounds great. Yeah. 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 But if you start playing reissues of that vinyl that were pressed this year for Record Store Day, that vinyl's going to sound like shit, guarantee you. There's yeah. nothing they can do about it. Right. The cards are stacked against it. A reissue of WC in the Mad Circle from 2017 is never going to sound as good as the original pressing. It's because of the lead. Is it because, because of the, the lead? lead? In part, it's the lead. It's the quality and quantity of the PVC that was being used to manufacture right. singles that were made in quantities of like 500,000. Right, right. Yeah. Well, yes, of course. If, if I could, you know, distill the, my point of view down to something very simple, it's this. Yeah, without being so macabre about it. And shit. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, I love vinyl. I make vinyl. My fans demand vinyl. It's vinyl, vinyl, vinyl all the time, right? I'm sitting here as we speak, surrounded by records, right? Yeah. Uh, so I guess all I'm trying to say is that I think that we need to be objective about where we are as a race, hum human race, where we are, you know, as a country, the things that have happened. It's not 92 anymore. It's 2017. Vinyl is a medium for transmitting data. Right, right. That's all it is. There's yeah. nothing romantic about it. Vinyl won't hump you. Vinyl won't get you laid. It's a piece of PVC in a piece of paper with wax and acid and whatever. And that is not necessarily necessary for you to hear the new people on Citizen record anymore. If you want to hear the new DJ Day and Thess One album... It's been on SoundCloud yeah. for like a month and a half. Yeah. By putting it on SoundCloud, it has zero carbon footprint. Zero. Maybe the servers take a little bit of power, but it's minuscule compared to what it's taking me to get it pressed in the Czech Republic, shipped over in a container, you, cutting down trees to put a sleeve around it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So... Vinyl is a complete and utter luxury at this point. It's completely unnecessary. And as soon as we can all fucking agree on that, we can move on, then we can celebrate our first world problems of like, ooh, do you have rare vinyl that's new? Tight for you. Right. You know? Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. That's it. Um, we don't need to go to swap meets and f obsess over this shit. Like whatever, like the fucking ice caps are melting. We're making vinyl records out of things that already exist digitally that you can stream that's all i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i think that's a great well point. another thing i mean speaking about peace lock 70 i mean i'm uh kind of fascinated with the fact that like you've sort of quietly uh, been like running this 
it's basically a record label, but but it's a little bit more than just that. And uh, although it's housed a lot of the recent People on the Stairs records since yeah. from Highlighter, the album Highlighter, up until now, but what I'd love to hear about is some of the other stuff that you guys have uh, that you have basically you know produced or project managed, conceptualized because it's not just like music one and it's not just records right. but but it's like i mean you did like fucking surfboard and the and like can you kind of break down some of the more kind of unique stuff um as like you know a small business owner type cat like what you guys have, what you have done with peace like 70 yeah i mean like well so after we transitioned or after we had kind of set up the infrastructure to be able to tour you know under yeah. the umbrella of peace like 70 right then it was like, all right, now we're touring. We need merchandise. Like, we should step our merchandise game up. So, you know, of course, you start with you've got your music merch. Then you've got, you know, T-shirts. And then... The basic, like, hip-hop stuff. Yeah. Right. And actually, like, it's funny because, like, very quickly I realized that, like, like I got, like, pretty particular about T-shirts. You know, like, I didn't want to just print, like, BVTs or whatever. So I was always trying to find, like, better blanks. Trying to... Uh, maintain good connections with my manufacturers and I always right. wanted I wanted to make everything locally too so I started going out to downtown and, and making connections with people shaking hands and building a really good network of printers of blank suppliers and just pounding the pavement I just I really hated um, you know ordering stuff online and waiting for it to come in a box yeah, like totally. I like to be like super hands on just like how when I used to go to like Bill Smith I like to go in the back and work the hopper and mix my vinyl yeah. you know so well, in, in Los Angeles, like you, you have so many resources to like, uh, you know, uncover, right? Yeah, and and I realized that you know, again, uh, you and I were talking off record about record collecting, and I realized over time that what I probably enjoyed more about record collecting was the actual process of traveling, meeting people, going to weird restaurants and whatever. Yeah, like this weird connection. Yeah, and yeah, and having those connections and seeing, you know, seeing Roy, a record recycler, say, hey, how you been, man, you know. And so I started to develop that in the manufacturing community, too, oh, where cool. it's like I would take a day trip, go back out to L.A. I'd see my boy David at Pagoda. I see all these guys and, you know, how's your kids been? You know, they know me. I walk in. They let me walk into the back and look through whatever sweatshirt blanks they have. So very quickly, I was able to set up like a real strong network of people that were kind of helping me get the merchandise stuff. Um, I got a good embroiderer for my pea hats. I got, you know, this and that. And I started going and buying hats, uh, hat blanks that like were like discontinued runs that came off like the back of like the garment district. And right, cool. Just really like you know, um, like you remember in the in the under the bridge video uh, uh-huh. where where Anthony Kiedis is like walking through downtown like high fiving people. Uh-huh, like there's yeah. been like so, a, a bunch of times where I walked down like Santee or like other streets, they were like, hey man, hey, you know, <laughs> hey, they, they, and there's like, hey, it's the hand man because the p the p sock with the oh, hand. Right. Yes. Everyone, all my guys remember that. So I'm the hand man or the p guy or like, right. but it has a p, you know. <laughs> so. You know, once that started, then I was like, all right, you know, like, this is going good. What else can we do? What else can we make? And uh, and then it just became, again, like, a, how absurd can we can we make this, you know? And, and a lot of it had to do with, you know, I think looking back on it now, like, when I was growing up, I didn't really have, like, a lot, but I wanted a lot. Okay. I yeah. always yeah. wanted, like, I used to get, like, Thrasher magazine. I would look in the back and, like, man, look at all these skateboard decks and look at all these wheels. And then get to the point where I have like a business with like a credit line I'm like I'm making skateboard decks and wheels because I I never like could do that when I was so you you manufactured wheels wheels decks uh, grip tape and then we put a book out nice yeah so what's the story with that who who, it's a non-fiction book it's a non-fiction book it's called The Mop by Alan Simpson and um, Alan basically had this collection of amazing stories he was kind of leaking online in forums and, and other places um, on Solstra and different places and I was reading this stuff and, and like any of the other projects I ended up putting out it was a situation where I'd reach out to him and be like dude what are you doing with this like yeah. are you are you gonna and the answer was always I don't know you know if someone was willing to do it I'd, I'd do it but I don't know how you know whatever Yeah. and that I, I went through a period of my life where that was like the, those were the magic words it was like the challenge of, of someone not being willing to put a project what are you doing with this yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's how DJ Day's album came about that's right. how the guitar album came about it was always like someone would let me hear something and I'd be like the world needs to hear this or the world needs to read this you know yeah. 
Um, well, I mean, it says a lot too when you have to you commit to putting your resources behind something too, because I mean, a lot of the most of the stuff you, you, that came out on under a piece like something, it's like people under the stairs, right. your solo uh, production material. So yeah, I mean, you always kind of create like a cool path for some of the other artists that came came through yeah i mean i figured you know with the fan base that we had built they trusted me and if i thought something was cool i always felt like they would get behind it yeah. too like for at least some of them they would think it's cool so like for someone like alan i'd be like man there's a bunch of people who'll probably end up reading this book if i get it out to our fans how was the what was the process of manufacturing a book like it uh, was gnarly yeah, because it's a hardcover bound book. I hardcover, saw it. leather bound. It's got gold uh, embossment on it. You know, I mean, we the the subject matter of the book is so crazy. I mean, in a nutshell, it basically tells the story of him working in porn shops in Kings Cross in Sydney, right on the cusp of the internet, kind of destroying the hand to hand commerce that were adult shops. Uh -huh. So it's nice. this, it's this transitional moment where an adult shop used to be like a record shop, and then. It basically, you know, by the end of the book, it's, it's uh, you know, cyber cafes have taken over right. the very, like, disgusting and tangible sex shop trade. Right. So, um, oh, yeah, helicopter going by. That's L.A. for you right there. Oh, yeah. Uh, Even in the nice neighborhood. You get <laughs> um, that's a sheriff. But, uh... Yeah, so well, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's interesting. I so, mean, so I, you know, I, the stories were amazing, and and so then it was a matter of how do we compile them, and because I had gone to school for writing, I figured I can just work as the editor and and yep. kind of work together with him, and you know, we probably spent a year working. I mean, he he it took him more than a year to write, and then we probably spent a year editing it and working on the manufacturing yeah. of it, not knowing how to do that. It was really difficult. Yeah, it's I mean, a huge learning curve in printing a 250-page book, you know. Yeah, I would certainly think so. I mean, um, what's the turnaround there? Like, how, like a record takes six months or more to to make what for a book? Is it a similar? Yeah, like, it was. Uh, it was a couple months, and we used the manufacturer in um, in the Midwest, uh -huh. you know. Um, but you know, little things like you know how many uh, there's certain names that publishers know, like terms, yeah, and they'd be like. You know, I forget the terms now, but, you know, there's a term to describe the number of blank pages at the end of the book so that the pages align correctly. Right, right. Um, and they were, they were like, hey, your so-and-so's off. And I'm like, my what? And I had to, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I'm sure it was a pain uh, for them to deal with me. But, you know, I felt, I felt compelled to do it because I believed in it. Yeah. And it wasn't, when I sat down to do it, I never once looked at the finances of it. Yeah. I never, when we sat down to do Days, Land of a Thousand Chances, I never looked at the finances and said, we shouldn't do a leather cover, gate, like, uh, tip, you know, tip on sleeve, because financially it makes sense or doesn't. I did it because I felt like the art deserved a ridiculous yeah. package. Mm -hmm. uh, same, th same thing with the mop. Like, I felt like the book, after all that, deserved, like, a really nice cover and a really, a really thick thing. And then my accountant would look at the numbers and go like, "What you're hemorrhaging money? Like, what do you?" I was basically using all my tour money and all the money that we were making on the road to subsidize these projects that were just losing, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. Okay. <laughs> um, well, then, it, how does like? <clears throat> I know this might be a jump because this is more like the current stuff, yeah. but how does the the surfboard stuff go? Like in the skate and the skate decks, like cause I those mean, are it, it, it loses money too, you know. <laughs> um, well, I guess anything when you're like, you know, selling your wares, like whether it be records or tapes or right. you know, books or surfboards. Yeah, there's always no one's gonna be getting rich off any of that type no, of stuff. No, no, especially if it's not, especially if it's creative stuff that you kind of believe in and you're and you're uncompromising in how you present it. Right. Because. The businessmen amongst us realize that the numbers don't lie and that, you know, if you're going to be successful and keep your doors open, you got to basically cut corners and do this and that. And there's the quantity of scale and all this wonderful business shit that me as an artist, it just turns me off. Yeah. And it's funny because my wife is a wonderful business person and I have to hide a lot of the business stuff I do from her because it would mortify her if she knew the business decisions I made in the name of art. Like she'd be like, what, you know, why are you doing that? And, um, and partly because I'm stubborn and partly because I feel like if I start making those decisions, it takes me really close to a traditional record label. 
in terms yeah. of business structure or really close to like all these people I despise in the industry who do make those decisions. Right. And uh, I'd rather lose money on a project and say, yeah, man, we did it and we lost money. You know what I mean? And yeah, it's shit business. It. I'm a shitty business person. I'm great with the manufacturing and the creative stuff, but I'm yeah, creative horrible. Stuff is great. Yeah. Horrible business person. Well, Worst ever. <laughs> But tell me now. I want to know. I do want to know about the if it weren't for stocks, I wouldn't even be around, dude. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, hey, I mean, regardless, like you still have a like. If people look back, you have like a wealth of material that you put out. I mean, beyond people on stairs, which in itself is, I think, is extremely impressive because you guys have, you know, ten. 11 albums well that's the other thing like I don't you know like looking back is a a big part of it I think because we've been doing it for so long I definitely place value even in the moment at what it's going to feel like 10 years from now Yeah, you know so it's easier for me to make those ridiculous business decisions uh, because I know that 5 years from now 6 years from now I won't remember that $1,700 or that $3,300 I'll only remember the physical thing that we made Right. Well, go, wow, this was rad. And I won't remember how much money I lost on it. As long as I can keep every piece lock afloat month to month, year to year, it never has turned a profit. Right. I've, I've paid myself, uh, I think the most I've ever paid myself in salary is like two grand. Yeah. But the money stays in the account as a slush fund for manufacturing and like whatever. Like the money comes in, goes out, touring money comes in, we spend money on other stuff. And it's not a. It's not something where like you're gonna see Thess rolling a Mercedes, guy roll a Rav Four from like '98. You know, like. <laughs> right. But I can still make like those businesses. You know, and that's a company car. That's the Peace Lot company car right there. Yeah. <laughs> that dirty ass. Rav4. Dirty ass Rav Four with surf wax all over it. But you know, because I drive a dirty ass Rav Four with 100,000 miles on it, that's a company car. I can also then, if you said to me, "Hey, I've got this amazing project," I'm like, "Let's go." Right, right. You know, let's pull money out. Let's do it. Yeah. So, um, you know, being able to make some decisions and not roll a Mercedes or whatever, like, it allows me also to make, like, creative decisions. Yeah. Like manufacturing and stuff. So that's basically what Peace Lock is. Peace Lock is this nebulous company that basically allows us to chase our any whim that we have, yeah. whether it be manufacturing, whether it be a book, a crazy piece of clothing. Like, I recently went through this whole thing where I was trying to track down the most comfortable sweatshirt in existence so that I could then make them right yeah and you know I probably blew through like four or five hundred dollars buying different sweatshirt blanks washing them wearing them and then finally we found like the perfect sweatshirt Nice. So what's, what's the? Uh, I can't tell you because then someone might hear it. They might. Yeah. Someone's gonna steal our merch. You it's know, a good sweatshirt is hard to find. Though. A good sweatshirt, is super hard to find. And this is this hoodie is gonna change the game. Is it? Okay. Cool. Yeah. I mean, it's slightly more expensive. Yet to come out. Has it come out yet? Um, we did some for I did some for chemistry. We uh-huh. did some chemistry ones out of it. There's a, a small run of them available, I think, on their website right now. But the thing is, low key, which I don't advertise, like they had to be sweatshop free, had to be made locally, cool. and like right. so, all those sort of things make it much more difficult. Like some people listening might say, "Well, how hard could it be to find a find a nice sweatshirt?" Yeah, well, it's, it's hard once you start saying, "I don't want it shipped in from China." I don't want it made in a sweatshop. You know what I mean? Like, sure. Especially once like American Apparel nosedived here, it really changed the whole like manufacturing garment game. Oh, I wonder. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Oh, it's they're gnarly. they're done, right? They're done, and then Gildan ended up buying like the brand out of bankruptcy. No way. Okay. And what's what's been happening uh, because of that is Gildan and all these Anvil, all these they're they're all kind of consolidating into one like one organization. Really. And they're changing their sizing. And their what t-shirts yeah so like now that american apparel is being absorbed in them american apparel sizing was always different yeah so now like the sizing is like all over the map like one large or medium shirt from one manufacturer like it used to fit a certain way and now sure. you buy the same shirt and it doesn't fit the same way because yeah. they're trying to chase like american apparel now that american apparel is gone yeah they've got like their fitting you know like an anvil 980 is a slim fit that's a blank an anvil 980 is like a slim slimmer fit and so as a manufacturer, merch manufacturer, you have to know that going into it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, of course. It's Absolutely. not it's not the same cut as like a, a beefy tee, you right. know, like an old school boxy off the shoulder thing. Yeah, people are really specific about what the kind of shirts they want. Too, for sure, you know? for sure. And when you're doing mail order stuff like I am, you know, the last thing you want is someone to get a shirt and like be like, dude, I hate my shirt. It doesn't fit. Right. You know, and some guys want a long L.A. fit. 
A lot of people want yeah. like a slim saw, you know. So yeah, the, the swap meet style T-shirts is a whole culture in itself. It with is thick neck, thick ass neck. That's a double K shirt right there, yeah. <laughs> and you know? long, long. And he wears another shirt on top of it, so the bottom shirt sticks out like a skirt. Like it's, right. it's like yeah, it's it works for him. Style. It's a long, it's a style, but like I don't wear that kind of shirt. And so it's definitely like a Southern California, LA, yes, thing. Yeah, and but I can't sell that. Like if I, I if I consciously manufacture merch like that, then right. I need to know what I'm getting into. Too. Right. So you have to, you know, I quickly realized like you, you're in this game, like all of a sudden I have to become like a fashion designer too. Like I at least have to be aware of these trends. Absolutely. And um, you have to be able to speak like eloquently to your suppliers. And so running Peace Lock has basically made me not only like the producer of the music artist and this and that, but I also am like really good at like, I have to deal with all the, you know, clothing, soft goods, manufacturing. Right. I know how to do embroidery art, like all the, all this stuff, right. minutia. Yeah. And you know, right now I'm working on making nice backpacks, leather patches. Right. Like they like really stepping it up because I have that ability now. I want to make nicer products. You know, yeah. I want to. I want to. If I'm gonna make a people want to sweatshirt, I want it to be the best. I don't want it to be some throwaway merch sweatshirt. I want it to be All the right. best sweatshirt and transition it into like an actual like not a brand, but something that's brand quality, brand caliber, yeah. like cut and sew almost. You know. What's the surfboard that you made or the collaboration you did? A, you sold, you're selling a surfboard too, right? Yeah, we had a surfboard that sold out, and it was basically if you bought the surfboard, you got the surfboard of a limited record that we attempted to put uh, <laughs> lacquer on. It didn't really work because uh, the PVC and the record didn't bind with the lacquer. Right. Oh, that scared the shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> um, hold on. So the thing, the, the thing with the surfboard, we tried to make the record. Um, and my buddy Jason, who's the owner and shaper of at Chemistry, uh-huh. he's like a hip hop head. He's a beat maker. He's down with like Exile and like goes way back. Okay, so cool. when we met, it was like instant like bond, you know. Um, but what we wanted to do is we wanted to cut up the master reel for Acid Raindrops, the, the half inch tape, and put it under the glass of the surfboard to kind of lock it in in perpetuity. Wow. So that's what we did. So like the 20 surfboards that we made all have a piece of the Aston Raindrops master reel under the, under the glass, like in, locked into the surfboard. That's incredible. So it's the actual uh, tape that it was recorded on. Yeah. Two-inch reel? Half, uh, the master tape. So it's a half inch, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And those sold down? Yeah. Dang. How did you... Did people mail order them? Yeah, we shipped some, and then there were some people... How, you, who, how the hell do you mail a surfboard? You put it in a big box. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know... And that's the other thing. Like, I had to, you know, we talked about, like, I had to learn clothing stuff. I had to learn shipping. I'm, like, a shipping expert because yeah. I ship every single order. So, like, for instance. You to, do all the shipping. I do all the shipping myself. Seven. Yeah. I do all the wow. shipping. I do all the fulfillment. do all the manufacturing. Run the, the whole thing. And partly because I don't trust anyone. It's, it's really complicated. And a mistake in shipping could cost me, you know. Sixteen dollars or eighteen dollars, and if that happens three or four times from an intern or whatever, like could put me out of business. I'm, my margin's not there. For right, right, right. Sustain that. Um, so and you don't really even have any employees. You're doing everything. No, I do right? it all. Yeah. I do it all. Like if I'm if I'm on the road doing shows, nothing's getting shipped. Right. So, but I can't. I I don't trust someone to go in there and start doing it because I just I don't know. I'd rather take the blame for something going wrong than than point a finger and get mad at someone else of course yeah. which is which like is, that too, it makes yeah. me a not successful business person because i'm not able to scale peace lock bigger until yeah. i get some employees you know but um uh what was i gonna say oh so i got really good at shipping you know like i know the shipping rates for everything i know like right. how to pack it and to like for instance to date this year so year to date for 2017 we're sitting here it's july 5th or whatever um, I've we've I've fulfilled I think I'm on order like 2007 or 8 for the year oh wow so I've shipped 2,000 and some odd orders since the beginning of the year or, you that's know, amazing by the end of the year it'll be yes. probably 5,000 orders yeah that's that's a, that's dope man I mean, it's a lot of packages yeah got a serious Uline account you know I get yeah. all you know I get all my stuff um, that's what's up well I want to I want to ask you about some specific music shit too before yeah. we totally wrap up like little bits here and there. One, I want to know if you ever think you'll get to a point of doing a solo record, releasing an actual Fest One album. You mean like Wonderful Radio? Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, I remember you telling me about this. <laughs> yes. And uh, something that's something you have been working on for a while. Is yeah, it, it's that, a that's a quagmire. That's like, I, yeah, that's that that started. That project is now probably eight years, nine years in the making. 
Right, and, and but that's you, nothing like the stuff you know. When, you know, the only thing that you really have as a solo artist, I guess, in a way, is just that a couple records on Tress Records, right? That and then, the, yeah, right. The, so like in the beat, the instrumental. So like lifestyle marketing, where the piece. I'm talking about you rapping. You be rapping on it? No, not really anything. Yeah. Um, I think. Yeah, I'd be interested to see what you would do as a as a both as a producer, but right. rhyming too. Yeah, I mean it. It's probably going to be more topical. Yeah. If I if and when I do it, because Mike and I, when we sit down to write songs, we always kind of try and agree on what the topic's going to be. Yeah. And if of the hundreds of songs we've made together, I can only think of one or two instances where I we we came to a complete disagreement about the vibe of the song. Are these on joints that came out? One of them is yeah. Like um, what's that? So um, I'm still kind of salty about it. <laughs> huh. um, I I felt very strongly on Highlighter that Uprock Boogie could be like a just straight club party banger, right? And Mike kept saying, "Oh, it's it's a silly song, it's a silly baseline." And I was like, "This is not a silly baseline. This is a fucking banger. This is a serious. We need to come <laughs> hard." Right. He's like, "Nah, man, that baseline is silly. We need to come whimsical." And I was like, "Nah, dude." <laughs> So we started writing the rhymes, and he came with this silly ass verse, and I was like, "God damn it, man! Like this is a straight twelve inch track. This thing yeah. goes." Yeah. And the song ended up kind of just getting buried and not having to run because I, you know he just I I try I had to tone my I wanted to come like LL on it I wanted to, I wanted <laughs> to come a ripping the fury right. out of it and he came in and he's like whip dot rib about boob and it's just this. <laughs> not saying right. any whimsical crap and I'm like god damn it man <laughs> um, uh, speaking of LL I want to know what um, I've been thinking about this recently too what's what do you what's your favorite LL if you uh, had a bigger endeavor is it yeah okay. yeah better than radio you know but LL is is I mean you've been in my house I have a picture of LL hanging in my living room yes and so yes, I know. everyone who comes to our house neighbors PTA parents like they have to deal with the fact that I have a giant picture of LL in my living room <laughs> near my fireplace right. um, which I love I love that and um, you know when I was a kid I loved Run DMC and Run DMC seemed you know amazing to me like they were really influential right. but they course, also course, seemed course. older to me like yeah. when I was when I was at Peck Park camp and I was kind of learning hip hop you know all the latchkey kids were there and whatever and hip hop was kind of raising us you know for lack of a better term Run DMC seemed old like the counselors there like right. they all had shell toes and leather and like whatever yeah and then and I you know I couldn't my parents couldn't give me shell toes or I didn't even know where to get shell toes or fat laces you know I was a kid <laughs> yeah. and then all of a sudden LL comes along and he's like you know he's scrunching his face at Run DMC and he's wearing like track suits and the Kangol, of course. But I, I looked at L and I was like, this dude is, and of course he was older than me, but I was like, at the time, I'm like, this dude's a kid. And he's <laughs> acting like a kid, you know? Right, and right. he's standing on top of radios. And, and it, it felt more uh, of my generation than Run DMC did. Sure, yeah. So I, I can was, understand that. I sure. identified really strongly with L because I, I was like, he was like my Kendrick when I was a kid, you know? Like, yeah, I mean, he was a gigantic star, even as a teenager I right mean, like yeah it's yeah. funny to think looking back um how because now he's like just a cultural american icon sure. in a weird way you know yeah. like a hollywood celebrity like ice cube yeah for sure you know um but like you know on the those first three albums yeah uh, i also i mean actually i i take that back because i probably i think maybe even more important to me is like Mama Said Knock You yeah, Out. It's an incredible album. Production-wise, too, it had a huge influence on me. Yeah. And even though it's a super popular song, uh, you know, I think Mama Said Knock You Out is a fucking masterpiece. Oh, the song itself The song is itself amazing. is insane. Yeah, yeah, and, sure. you know, L, L being, you know, semi-drunk off old gold and just... Right. Just going, just ra rapping with such abandon and like recklessness, you know. And yeah, like, no. It, it seemed like a full. It seemed to me like like that was the full extension of everything I believed he was when I was a kid. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the joint. My joint on this record is. Um, I could list the. I could list the song. Like my, I, you know, there's like Milky Cereal. My, my shit was cheesy. Human System. Human System was amazing. Cheesy Rap Blues cheesy is one of his most hilarious rhymes. Fantastic. It's just straight comedy. It's so yeah. funny too. Like I mean, I you know that was the thing. Like L, even when I was a kid, he had those. He had those songs. Like so, 
I remember like for one talent show, I rolled up and I was like, they used to have talent shows at the rec center. And I rolled up and I was like, yeah, I wrote a song. They were like, oh shit, let's hear your rap song, you know? And I was just, all right. The president vote and he called the Pope. The Pope flew to heaven on a golden rope. He asked the Lord to raise Michelangelo from the dead so he could make a fresh painting of my head. Then I hung out and I did the whole LL. I stole his whole thing. <laughs> yeah. But it was because it, it's my rhyme ain't done. And it was a, it yeah. was a rap about like, you know, Peter Pan, like, I don't know, Snoopy was in the song. I mean, it was all these, like, childhood, like, ridiculous things. Yeah. And it's just when I heard it, my head was just, just steam coming out of my ears. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. Because Run DMC never would make something so, like, whimsical, you know? Right, like, just, right. like, ridiculous, you know? And I was like, damn, this dude, he's hard. And he raps about cartoons and, and girls. And I, I was just like, yo, this like, that's it, you know? Yeah. Did you ever see, have you ever seen him live? I haven't, and but every time I see Zach or Z Trip, yeah, I, I'm like, I'm like, dude, come on, man, you gotta invite me to dinner when L's coming, because that's my boys. He's my yeah, boy. Yeah, Z Trip. Yeah, you guys go uh, way back. And yeah. he's DJing for L right now, and I so know, I'm which like, is amazing. It's one degree of separate. It's like so close, I can feel it. Yeah. And I just want to sit across from the dinner table and be like, Yo, L, I wrote this rhyme. Check this out. The president vote, and he called the vote. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Why are you yelling? My rhyme ain't done at me <laughs> from across the dinner table. Um, uh, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I love LL. Uh, I also, I got to wonder and ask too, if and when, or when do you think uh, the part three of the getting off stage is going to happen? Is it, you think this year, perhaps, maybe? I think so. I mean, we're working on it. Yeah. The, the problem with the finishing that record is there's so much weight upon it now. Yeah. And it's, it's like, it's like getting like, it's getting to the point where it's like wonderful radio where it's going to be hard to finish because everyone's expecting it, waiting, right. asking about it. And it puts way more pressure on a record than usual. And if I look back at our some of our favorite projects, it was when we didn't have any pressure. Of course. Like when we were talking about Stepfather and we were just trying to be as ridiculous as possible to piss everyone off. Right. Or even the next step when it was just like your own... Yeah first yeah. thing you know exactly yeah. you know and like and we weren't we weren't letting the pressure kind of get to us and if if anything i feel like part one and two if i could fault them for something is that they're too heavy as people on stairs records like they're too subject matter subject matter tone they're, tone they're too sure. like they're too like heavy and so part three i don't want it to have that feel i want it to be more along the lines of an ost or a stepfather yeah yeah but it's going to be hard because everyone's like oh it's going to be the last record and you know you gotta gotta come with it so then i guess there's really there should be no rush at all though yeah. i don't think there is yeah. man and i and honestly i don't want it to be an ep i think that the last one will be a full 80 minute classic people on stairs record <laughs> with 25 songs on yeah it. and i already know what the cover is going to be it's going to be just the wall yeah with the shadows on it with us completely faded out which is sort of inspired by um uh back to the future right yeah right and the, you know the whole like marty's in the picture and he disappears in the picture is his family's it? disappearing because yeah. he can't save he can't change the re his reality so his family his brothers and sisters are basically actively disappearing as he's like living through reality and it's deep it kind of that you know and then you know with pat dying and everything that's been happening like it i i just had to kind of pull like the emergency break on the whole project i didn't want to deal with it you know yeah um just too much heavy shit too much going on yeah it'll take your time you know it'll happen though you know and i've got beats that we mike's working on beats and i got stuff that we're kind of sitting on that's special cool so you know it'll be it'll be good i think <laughs> I think so too. I mean, of course, I'm, I'm like your number one fan. Man. I could do uh, I could do my LL rhymes on the on the whole album. I could just do might have my to. rhyme ain't done. <laughs> <laughs> um, one other thing that's kind of like uh, of the people on the stairs lore, a really fest one is that that sort of now, um, you know, uh, iconic uh, battle between you and Will I Am of of Ryan right. High Peace. AKA right. the App Band Clan. The App Band Clan. And well, I forgot about that when I was telling the App Band Clan opening act story at Unity. I forgot that then Will and I cross paths many times, sometimes yeah. publicly, sometimes personally. Are you guys cool? I can't really stand that dude. But you know, that battle was the was the culmination of all of these things that had been simmering, all of these run ins. 
you know, was like something that you consciously like we should battle each other or or no, someone put you together. No, yeah, Dust it was Dusk. Together? Dusk kind of did it, and I didn't know who the other person was going to be. Like from the beginning, they wanted me to be part of that series because that was the, the original series. Because what, what was it called again? The beat battle, okay, but they or the root down sound clash, but they yeah, root they down, went, which is that little temple, right? And, and, the, it's and we now were, the virtual. We were original like root down dudes, so we went back. The original plan was for them to do just like three of them. They went back and did more with other people, but yeah. we were the original. Like when root down started, and it was at the Yaya T bar on La Brea. Oh, okay. And like it was just like Miles Tackett, Cut Chemist with DJ, me and Double K would show up. It was like eight people. Nine right. people, and this—I'm well, talking like mid, late '90s, whatever. And spot, it became this big iconic thing when it ended up at Gabba and all that sort of thing. So, when Dusk did that, it was a way of kind of putting all the guys that came out of that scene together into one thing. Well, Will was an outlier. Like we would see, like Will would be walking through. I remember this one time, me and Double K were going to this party, and uh, Will was walking through the parking lot, and he was like, "He's like, hey, what's up, shit face?" <laughs> like he—that was the kind of dude he was. He's a motherfucker, uh -huh. you know. And he was a sassy, like, little bitch about everything. And he never was really fully a part of the scene, in my yeah. opinion, you know? Because we were all, like, I'd see Newmark, I'd see all these people and shit, and I'd see this thing, hey, what's up, shit face, you know? Um, and <laughs> yeah. okay. he just thought he was just fucking walked on water, you know, even from the beginning. And so the funny thing about that battle is at the end of the battle, everyone's kind of, like, booing. Some people are booing him. He had, like, a lot of fans in the crowd, too, you know? Sure, because, I mean, the Black Eyed Peas were already an extremely popular group. Yeah. And, I mean, Way more got, popular than people on the stairs. Yeah, yeah, the time. yeah. I mean, sure. this is early 2000s, right? Yeah, or I was even, not, even that, is it 99 or 2000? Yeah. I was total... It might have been a little later. Yeah. Okay. I was total underdog in the, in the battle. Right. He had a roadie set up all his stuff. I mean, he had his roadies load all his stuff in, and... At the uh, at the end of the battle, some people were booing him, and he was like, he's like, he's like, uh, uh, fuck you guys, uh, he's like, he's like, I don't care, uh, I'm 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 leaving here to go work with Justin Timberlake. You guys suck my dick. I'm going to work with Justin Timberlake. And I thought he was uh, like just being will, because that's how he. I thought he was just being sassy and shit, yeah, and and being an asshole. But it turns out he actually was leaving to go work with Justin Timberlake on Where Is the Love. <laughs> That night. That's hilarious. And um, what was, So you guys had very different equipment, though, that night. He came in with, like, a Pro Tools rig. Yeah, two like, NPCs, a full Pro Tools rig. Most of what, of what he on was... On that little ass stage. Most of what he was doing was all pre-programmed in a Pro Tools session that he was playing. Okay. And then he had, like, two synthesizers set up. And, you know, I basically had my NPC in an old drum machine, and that was pretty much Yeah, what it. was it? You had a really old drum machine. Yeah, right? it was a Wurlitzer Sideman. And it was, uh, it's basically, like, the first drum machine ever. And wow, it's super mechanical, and it was super risky for me to take it up on stage because it only worked half the freaking time. Right, and it worked there though. It worked, yeah. you know, and it, it kind of went off beat, and I got got a little weird during my thing. But it was funny because it really infuriated Polo, who's Will's manager, uh -huh. and so Mike and uh, the rest of the quote unquote crew, none of them were there that night. I was pretty much there solo. Like people had other shit they had to do, and so I was loading my stuff out alone. I had no crew, I had no one with me. And Polo, like, like cornered me in the parking lot. And he started, like, trying to, like, fucking, like, wanted to, like, fight me. I'm carrying my NPC out. <laughs> and and I, and he's, like, he's just being, like, a little yappy, like, terrier. Yeah, 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 This is the same dude who slapped Perez Hilton later and got, like, really? criminal charge. Yeah, this is, like, a thing for him. Um, but, yeah, I'm like, dude, why are you fucking with me, man? Like, you guys, don't you guys have to go work with Justin Timberlake? Like, you know. But the idea that maybe even a single person in the crowd didn't think that I got completely murked by fucking Will bothered them. It really bothered right. them. And I was throwing candy out to the crowd, and Will had just done a Dr. Pepper commercial where they were in, like, full, like, not blackface, but it was, like, white gloves and top hats and shit. Gotcha. And so I was wearing the top hat, and the, you know, and... Um, <laughs> It was just a big joke to me, you know. Yeah, I, and like you know, yeah, it was recorded and it came out. Yeah. It was a CD that came out, right? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and then I heard, like you know, I remember there was a music store that everyone used to go to on Sunset that uh, a couple guys we knew worked at, and I remember B Plus was in there, and someone called me like, "Yo, B Plus is in here going on a tirade about you, like about how you lost and how when." I was like, "What? Put that fucker on the phone!" Like you know, <laughs> it, it actually became like it was funny because. 
that's when I realized that something that I was just like living in the moment, it, it actually like resonated with like a lot of people. And I also didn't think about the video and that it was people yeah, would watch it. Was a video it. Of yeah, it. like I didn't think about any of this stuff. It was just I was, was just released on a DVD. If I'm yeah, not I didn't know. I didn't know they were going to do that. Yeah. I got like one copy of it later from B plus, you know, right. he's using one who released it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, it, you know, it's funny how like little things like that, like that happen, they end up being like bit much bigger than they felt at the time. Yeah, absolutely. I remember so fun. Well, one, people don't do that that much anymore. There isn't that real kind of like competition. That's like, it's, there's some tension, but you guys kind of work it out on stage in a weird way. And yeah, you got words. I mean, you know, some, in the parking lot, you know, like people know, yeah, like these beat battles now or whatever. Yeah. No one's so coming to more, blows in the parking lot. Yeah, it's, not, it's a little more contrived in a way. Yeah. And, and I mean, uh, like me and Will had like personal history. So I was dating this girl, Maggie, and her best friend was dating Will before Will blew up. Uh -huh. So like I'd be, a, I'd be at Maggie's house and like Will would call at four in the morning and be like, hey, is my girlfriend over there? And I'd be like, no, dude, like fucking don't call here at four in the morning, <laughs> right, motherfucker. Right. You know, so we had... It, I, I, we had tension, yeah, had strife, you know. Like so, I think that's what made it such a fun battle was because it was like an opportunity oh, yeah. to settle it like that, you know. Yeah, and you did this joint, which I remember uh, that I used to love. I was so fond of because I'd heard the beat. I think uh, bef before you had, uh, um, before then, but it was that Three's Company fucking. Oh track, yeah, so. yeah, right. That the where it flipped the Three's Company thing. Yeah, and um, so dope, man. Yeah, did that ever exists on in anything. I don't think so. You no. guys never rhymed on that track mm -mm. or anything like that? Nah. Nah. Yeah, I love that track. There was that and there was like, I mean, again, like this is the days before like I could go up there with a Serato or whatever. I was, I had a zip drive and I was like frantically trying to load the beats in the, in the downtime, you know? <laughs> yeah. On stage in on front stage. of like a packed house. Yeah. While he's, you know, playing his thing, I'm trying to get the beats loaded and I'm, I'm trying to like cue everything, make sure it's good. And, um, the, it was done live on the MPC and the beats were so like ambitious and it was just Oh, dude, it was very, very nerve-wracking yeah, like, to do that, you know. Um, and then by the time, then he took his shirt off, and it got super weird on stage. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and you know, and he would talk after everything, and I didn't say anything. Yeah. And he would grab the mic from dusk and start talking, and it, it, it's just classic LA shit, man. Yeah, it's, LA is a very competitive town. I feel like. Yeah. I don't. As an outsider, I come here. I love. I love the scene. I love that there's a lot of. Uh, artists that coexist here but there is a lot of competition in this town yeah know? I mean we're not uh, in you know it's not a very supportive town of other people uh -huh. okay. um, probably you know and and then also you you end up with like clicks and crews yeah would and, you like yeah I mean that seems pretty evident I mean there's lots of different micro genres of stuff and yeah. there's a lot of you know thriving musicians right now especially like producers and beat makers right. DJ types and and, and hip-hop but and like the more jazzy fusion type shit. Yeah. But um, do you think, this is something I've always kind of wondered too, because, you know, I lived in California for a long time, but not in LA, but this sort of like these factions and groups, is it like a part of just LA culture? Because gang culture isn't that different from, from you know, music subcultures and yeah. stuff like that. I think so, man. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that, you know, maybe because of Hollywood's history here or gang history, but I think here, and maybe in New York, I don't know, but I think politics plays a huge part of everything, uh -huh. and people are really political about stuff. Right. Like, political in, like, the classic sense, right? So, someone like me who will do an interview like this and say shit, like, yeah, I don't really fucking like you. Like, people weren't talking like that in the scene. Right. Everyone was like buddy, buddy, whatever. And then when you start getting these people who are like, "Yeah, I, I fucking, I don't care if people know that the guy's an asshole or whatever." Well, you can't like it I breaks mean, like this code, and people, yeah. you know. And me personally, like, I, I don't care. I don't care. But maybe I, maybe at point at sometimes I should have cared a little more too, <laughs> because you know you end up you end up getting pushed out of certain clicks and crews or not asked to do certain things. Yeah. And it's probably financially hurt us or me. You know, I don't know. Or people say, oh, that dude's like an asshole or whatever. But I, the other thing was I always had to be the business person. You know, Mike got to be party boy every time. I had to drive I had to drive us home every time. I drove every mile of every tour that we've ever done. So, you know, some crew or some famous people come in and they want to smoke a blunt. Like, I pro I can't go and smoke or go and take shots. Yeah, and some people cats could misinterpret yeah, that. Yeah, people buy me a shot and I don't drink it. They're like, that guy's a fucking asshole. Yeah. Like, yeah, I got to settle up. I got to run the numbers and I got to drive Mike home and me home. 
yeah do the you know so obviously that's going to make you look less desirable in terms of like the scene and whatever like no one wants that dude around right yeah i mean it's like krs said it's like who you're down with and who you clown with you know and like you know it's uh but most of all you got to have a gift yeah and uh no and and that's one thing that i can always say about you guys is just you're extremely talented you're great at what you do and like it's not it doesn't it's not about like clicks and high school type antics and shit where it's like it's who you're who you roll with make validates the quality of your artwork and shit you know like you guys have done well i mean you're an uh, incredible producer um but like the fact that you that as a group people on the stairs have have uh, maintained you right. know through some real lulls in the industry in the right. indie hip-hop world right and beyond it's like, you know, it's a testament to the music. It's not really about, like, you know, oh, I'm, like, cool, this cat or this label yeah. or whatever, you know. So. It's that. I mean, I, I personally feel like there's people who are way more talented than I am naturally. So, I, but I was able to make make up for it by, like, you know, working three times harder than yeah, a lot of the work. other dudes. And staying up later and making decisions that were tough to make. Whether it meant leaving a label at a certain time, joining a label at a certain time, leaving a yeah. party at a certain time, cutting, burning a bridge with someone, it all, everything I ever did, and if I ever offended anyone or anyone thought I was like, you know, whatever, it was only because I was looking out for Mike and myself and people on the stairs and our fans. That's all, you know? Yeah. And it's like that, because of that, I had to make a lot of like, I had to do a lot of shitty, not shitty things, but I probably had to do things that maybe people thought were weird or whatever. And also, I was chasing this vision of something entirely different that there was no blueprint for. Yeah, you know? that's for sure. Like, there was no blueprint for a group turning into, like, a peace lock or whatever and, right. and doing all this sort of stuff and then funding other people's stuff, you know? And also, like, a hip-hop group that, you know, we all age and we're getting older and, and you got to keep, you know, keep things moving along. Like, you guys have, you figured out little ways and it's not an easy task to do that, especially without you know a publicist a manager right. you've always done this without a management or like a, a oftentimes with just on your label alone the last decade plus it's just been you right and mike and and like you know and the and the folks that support right. buying buying tickets to the shows or actually buying the albums or right. streaming the shit and then me shipping it to them and all that sort yeah. of stuff and yeah like i like right now on my phone i probably have well, let's see i'll pull it out according to my phone i have Two missed calls and 7,263 missed emails. Right. Like, from over the last years, right? Yeah. So, like, people will email me about this or that, and, like, I miss the email, I don't get back. Because it's just, there's, I'm constantly juggling, like, all these different things, and inevitably some stuff slide, slides through the cracks, you know? Of course. But it's always, it's always only because the, the vision is to keep this going. Right. In whatever way I can. Yeah. You know? Well, I love it, man, and, and dude, I consider you like a brother to me, man. Yeah, We're good, likewise, good man. friends. You looked out for me in my time of need, too, which I, I, I'll always be indebted to you for. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, my first time ever coming to L.A. was sleeping on your couch and shit. <laughs> so uh, I'm so glad we can have all this time to do, like, yeah, really talk about the group, talk about your life and career and shit, man. So thanks. Yeah, no, thanks for having me on the podcast, man. Yeah, Appreciate sure. it. And, yeah. and anyone, any stories I got wrong? Anyone I'm, you know, misspoke over, uh, pissed off. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> don't take this as public. Don't take this as like history, you know, because everyone remembers stuff uh, differently. And I think that's the funny thing about hip hop. And it's a good thing you're but, doing this. Is get everyone's perspective on yeah, how sure. they remember it. You know, yeah. It's just cats riffing. We're just human beings. And so it's all good. You know? yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, dude, like ultimately, you know, if if there was one takeaway like we talked about this a while ago but it's it's just that dude it's it's not that serious you know and yes. if there was anything that hurt this that's i feel like has hurt hip hop and this genre of music the most is that it's become a burden and a cross to carry for some people and it should never be that way you know right. like if we could all just go back to ll rapping about cartoon characters and biz then that's what's going to keep this alive that's what'll keep the youth coming in and excited about it yeah. But as soon as it becomes like this, like overwrought, like hand wringing, like elements and this and that, like it, we're already destroying it by doing that. Like it's, it well, should yeah. be fun and entertaining. Yes. It's yeah. Music, it's just music, man. It's just music, man. Hell yeah. I mean, I could talk to Thess, to Chris, Portugal, for 15 hours straight. I, that's um, 
So I hope you guys appreciate it. I want to thank Thefts for taking this time. We did this over the course. It was three different conversations. So I also want to thank CJ Stewart for editing this. Um, obviously, we had to piece together uh, a bunch of stuff between this and episode 50. If you haven't heard the, the conversation I did with Thefts on episode 50, please go back to that. It's uh, essential listening for any fan of his work or people under the stairs. And listen, don't forget to subscribe to the Houseless Podcast. My name is Peter Agassi. I'm the host and producer of the show. I appreciate every single one of you guys that listens. Uh, no matter where you are in the world, I see it's from different cities and towns in America uh, and all over the world, different countries tuning in um, to spread the word. That's all I ask. And again, uh, pre-order that Prince Paul album. It's True Mental on limited edition double vinyl and tape with the uh, free download to Redux, a completely different Prince Paul produced project coming with the vinyl. Get it at Redline Music Distribution dot Big Cartel dot com and it'll be shipping in September. And check out for those tour dates too. You've been listening to the house list. My name is Peter Agostin. I'm gonna end this show with another little unreleased people on the stairs joint. And uh this one is called Cloud. This is an old song. This is probably from the late 90s. And um, I'm not going to put too much of out <laughs> put um, too much of it out there, but nevertheless, just a little taste for for especially for the people on the stairs super fans out there. Um, enjoy it. And I will catch you guys on the next episode. You know, Thank you so much. Later y'all. I made a statement, it was at a rally in Hollywood where we had marched down the middle of Hollywood Boulevard and then had a big rally. And I made a statement that the 1970s would be the most determinative decade in the history of man. It's like basically all B-boys. And no certainly it was. All in the 1970s, the, 70s, the die was cast the decade of the cloud. as far as the things Seen that did. B-boys be proud from day one. See if he was born in 70, they be 26. See if he was born in 80, then most b-boys be falling somewhere in between. I mean, we're all, I mean, those two, we're all clowns. You know, I used to lay on my back and beat them. You know, it's like basically the next generation is depending on us to drop the knowledge we accumulated. Remember, unless we lived it, we have an obligation to really keep it with You know, pass it on to the next generation and unfold us new values and ideals of self-expression in the hip-hop culture. Graph artists, dancers, MCs, and DJs, that's not the decisive of the night. I'm on I, par excellence, his reverence, honorable, that's one's nonchalance, renaissance, poet, commanding letters to lackluster minute men, moet.